Well, good morning. We're here to discuss the constitutional restraints on police interrogation. On Friday, March 30, 1934, near the small community of Scuba, Mississippi, a 60-year-old farmer named Raymond Stewart was killed in his home. The Meridian Star reported that Stewart was well-known and highly esteemed. He was of a quiet, unassuming disposition, winning friends easily, um, excuse me, and often entertaining friends at his home. News of his tragic death was received with a great shock by many, close quote. It was a grisly murder. Mr. Stewart's head was beaten almost to a pulp, reported the paper, apparently by an ax or a pick. Someone had to pay. And in 1934, in Scuba, Mississippi, it was to be three black men, Ed Brown, Henry Shields, and Arthur Ellington. On April 4, the three men were indicted, and counsel was appointed to defend them. Trial began the next morning, nothing like allowing the defense time to prepare, uh, and concluded the following day. The evidence of their guilt, all three confessed while in police custody. Because they were guilty? No, because they were beaten savagely. One was twice hung from a tree limb. Abrasions from the rope on his neck were plainly visible during the trial. When that didn't get him to confess, he was tied to a tree and whipped. Still no success, so he was whipped again and made to understand it would continue until he did confess. So he did. The others were laid over chairs and whipped with a leather strap with metal buckles. They continued to be beaten as they confessed and were fed information in order to get their confession to match the details of the crime. A police deputy was questioned about the beatings at trial, asked how severely he beat the defendant. His answer, quote, not too much for a Negro, not as much as I would have done if it were left to me, close quote. Two others admitted the beatings, none denied them. The defendants were found guilty and sentenced to death. Fast forward to January 22nd, 1957, New York City. Vincent Joseph Spano is drinking in a bar and he puts his money on the bar to pay for his drinks. Another bar patron takes the money and leaves. So Spano follows and a fight ensues. Only it isn't much of a fight. The thief was a former professional boxer who had once fought in Madison Square Garden. He knocks Spano down and then kicks him in the head three or four times for good measure. Spano vomits and the barkeeper applies some ice to his head. Spano then walks to his apartment, obtains a gun, and walks the eight or nine blocks to a candy store where his assailant and thief was often known to hang out. In full view of the youth supervising the store, Spano fires five shots. Two hit their target, killing him. Spano leaves and goes into hiding. A week and a half later, Spano calls a longtime friend, Gaspar Bruno, and Bruno was almost a police officer. He was attending the police academy. Spano explained what had happened and said that he planned to get a lawyer and turn himself in. And he did just that. Accompanied by a lawyer, he turned himself in at 7.10 p.m. Questioning or interrogation would begin at 7.15 p.m. and would continue for the next eight hours. For the first six hours, Spano repeatedly again and again refused to answer any questions and asked to be permitted to contact his attorney. Around 1 a.m., something new was tried. Friend Bruno was brought in equipped with a lie. Because of Spano's call, Bruno lied, his job was now in jeopardy, a job which he needed to support his pregnant wife and three children. Nothing doing, Spano continued to explain that his attorney told him not to answer any questions and again requested to be permitted to talk with that attorney. But if you don't succeed, try, try again. So during a four such session, session lasting a complete hour uh, with the false friend, Spano finally confessed. He was prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced to death. One final quick story. Just six years later, March 3rd, 1963 in Phoenix, Arizona. An 18-year-old girl leaves her job at a movie theater concession stand, takes a bus home. As she's walking from where the bus leaves her off to her home, she's kidnapped, forced into the back of a vehicle where she's raped. When she's released, she runs home, tells her family who contact the police. Ten days later, they make an arrest, and conduct a lineup at which she makes a positive identification. So two police officers then question the suspect, the suspect, alleged perpetrator. Two hours later, the officers emerge with a written confession. There are no allegation of threats, intimidation, or promises made. His sole complaint is that he did not have an attorney present, although he had never requested one. 
and his name was Ernesto Miranda. All right, so what unites these three cases? Well, they're the arc upon which the Supreme Court has built the constitutional law of police interrogation. As is often the case, the line has not been precisely straight. There have been zigs and zags, but they will give us enough in the limited time we have here today to understand the basic doctrines. And there are several constitutional rights at play. We will discuss two of them. Both are found in the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which provides that, quote, no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, the Fifth Amendment, being in the original Bill of Rights, only restricts the federal government. But the Fourteenth Amendment contains the same due process guarantee, and it is held to be incorporated in that due process the same privilege against self-incrimination. So in short, these rights restrict both state actors and federal actors. So how about the savage beatings in our first case in Brown versus Mississippi? Three black men were hung and beaten until they confessed. The Supreme Court has held that one of the due process protections is to prohibit police conduct that shocks the conscience. And that means just like what it sounds, police conduct that is shocking or appalling or horrifying. If police conduct shocks the conscience, it's independently a constitutional violation. So in other words, the very action is a constitutional violation. So a person could seek redress for that interrogation, say seek civil damages in a lawsuit, even if there never were a prosecution or other proceeding against the person as a result of the interrogation. Well, the beatings in Brown surely shock my conscience, and I hope uh, they shock all of yours. Not only is it brutality, but it's stupidity. Right? Uh, it might be one thing to torture in order to learn information only a perpetrator could know or would know, but here they fed information during the beatings, forever tainting the investigation. After these beatings, we can never know for sure what these suspects knew. Thankfully, today the case would be an easy call. Police cannot physically torture to obtain a confession. If they do, it's a constitutional violation. But what if it were barbaric, and of course in that case racist as well, but put those aside, what if it weren't stupid? What if a suspect had just confessed to burying a young woman alive? Would it shock your conscience if police beat him in order to find her location? What if they merely threatened to do so, putting a gun to his head, hoping that he won't call their bluff? What if the suspect has confessed to planting a bomb in a crowded city that will detonate that evening? What if it's a dirty nuclear bomb? Would it shock your conscience if police beat him in order to find it and defuse it? We haven't had such a case, but there's certainly been lively scholarly debate. Some argue physical torture is always conscience shocking. As a deontological matter, meaning as a matter of ethics or morality, it is grossly unacceptable, these would posit, for police to interrogate with physical violence. Some come to the same conclusion, but for consequentialist reasons. Police will get it wrong when to use such authority. Far more innocents will end up suffering than guilty, and permitting government torture, even if only intended for extreme circumstances, will seep into our culture and will give rise ultimately to more violence, not less. Others would permit torture, but only if authorized by a neutral third party, presumably a court, arguing we should create a process for, in essence, torture warrants bringing into the light of day what will otherwise occur in darkness. So we now know one point of constitutional law. There's a little caveat there because we don't have uh, the decision in all cases. But we know that physical torture will typically, if not always, shock the conscience and therefore violate due process. And you can each decide whether that should be typically or always. Well, what about our second case in which Spano was ultimately persuaded to confess by false friend Bruno? Does his eight-hour interrogation shock the conscience? Well, it's at least a much harder case, certainly, than Brown. And the judicial answer is likely to be no. So if that's right, he isn't going to have any redress for the interrogation itself, meaning he would not be able to sue and obtain damages just for the interrogation. But can he nonetheless prevent his confession from being used against him at trial. After all, we said the Fifth Amendment guarantees that no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. So the answer is yes, he can prevent admission of his confession. Spano's confession is not admissible if it was given involuntarily. 
And to determine whether a confession or other statement is voluntary, we look to the totality of the circumstances. So you consider everything. You consider the manner of interrogation and the characteristics of the accused. So it matters that the interrogation lasted eight hours at night. It matters that they continually ignored his request for counsel. It matters that they lied. It matters that Spano was 25 had only a junior high education, and had never had any experience previously with the criminal justice system. For these and other reasons, the Supreme Court held that his confession was involuntary and therefore inadmissible. So now we know a second point of constitutional law. An involuntary confession is inadmissible. And to determine voluntariness, we have to consider everything and ask whether in totality, all those circumstances, did the police overbear the suspect's will. So let's now take a step back and ask whether that makes sense. After all, one of the things we criticized with Brown was not merely the barbarity, but also the stupidity. They elicited, presumably, a false confession, meaning we end up punishing an innocent and the guilty person remains at large free to pray again. This was not a concern, is it, in Spano? There were many witnesses to his altercation at the bar he, the youth at the candy store, saw him shoot the victim. He confessed to Bruno on the telephone before ever turning himself in. So we can be very confident in Spano's case that we've got the right guy. So what do we care if it's a bit uncomfortable obtaining this true and accurate confession? Well, it seems clearly that not only reliability of confessions is at interest, right? There must be more. Uh, one concern, so to be clear, one concern with aggressive police interrogation is reliability, right? It can lead to false confessions. And as recently as 10 years ago, I'd wager I'd have trouble, maybe, uh, getting some of you to accept that there are false confessions, at least absent torture. But thanks to DNA exonerations, we now know that this has been proven beyond all doubt. We could debate how often they occur, but they do uh, occur. But when there isn't a reliability concern, so put that aside, say in a case where you can be certain, like Spano's, that you don't have the concern of a false confession, why suppress a confession? And we can make this very stark, right? Instead of the stupid brutality of Brown, what if police use a smarter brutality? They torture obtaining, and by that torture, obtain something that only the actual perpetrator could know. Spano makes clear the court would still not accept such a confession. It would be involuntary, it would be inadmissible. So one of the concerns is reliability, but what are the others? There are at least two, and they're closely related. One we've discussed before, and that's morality, or ethics. There may be some interrogation methods that are effective, but we simply deem them morally unacceptable. They're unfair. Yes, if we solve less crime, more innocents will suffer at the hands of criminals, but sometimes it's morally superior to allow harm to occur than to commit it yourself. As an example, consider the Guantanamo Bay interrogations of Mohammed el Qatani, allegedly a would-be 9-11 hijacker who was denied entry into the United States, so did not become one, and he was later captured in Afghanistan. Among other physical deprivations, according to MSNBC, he was forced to wear a bra. He had a thong placed on his head. He was massaged by a female interrogator who straddled him like a lap dancer. He was told that other detainees knew he was gay. He was told that his mother and sisters were whores. He was forced to dance with a male interrogator. He was strip searched in front of women. He was led on a leash and forced to perform dog tricks. He was prevented from praying. He was forced to watch as an interrogator squatted over his Quran. Close quote. Even if not unreliable, many deem such tactics morally unacceptable and therefore unfair. Finally, there are concerns of what might best be termed mental freedom. Imagine police know that a suspect in a recent heinous murder is a devout Roman Catholic. So at the time of the next scheduled confession, or confessional, instead in place of the priest, one of the officers sits in, and indeed the suspect confesses. First, is that confession unreliable? I think not. Right? What possible reason would the person have for confessing before God if he didn't have blood on his hands? Is it coerced? Well, maybe by God, right? but that's not our concern. Right? We're worried about uh, what man, except for maybe it is in this limited sense. This suspect wanted to confess to God, 
but not to man. And so by sitting in as a priest, the police officer unacceptably interfered, arguably, with that mental freedom. So when the Supreme Court speaks of involuntariness, it's thinking not only about potential unreliability, but also fairness and mental freedom. And this all gets put into that totality mix when we're trying to ask whether the will of the suspect was overborne. Well, we have one case left. What about Ernesto Miranda? His two-hour interrogation does not shock the conscience and they did not overbear his will. There were no threats, there were no promises. They warned him, in fact, that before they obtained the confession, they warned him that any statements he gave would be used against him. Yet, as you can probably guess, given his last name, Miranda, the Supreme Court held his confession was not admissible at trial. Why? Because the court was concerned that the two constitutional tests we now know, shocks the conscience and voluntariness, were too nebulous or unclear to protect rights during incommunicado police interrogation. But our time is up, so the story of those Miranda warnings will have to wait for another lecture. <laughs> Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.